Hey everyone, welcome to March's Rock Game Dev Workshop. So glad you could join us. In case this is your first time tuning in to Rock Game Dev Talk, I'm Sam, Rock Game Dev's Talk Coordinator. Rock Game Dev is an organization dedicated to fostering a community of game creators in Rochester, New York. Our mission is to provide a local platform for game creators at beginning, in, in, sorry, at beginner, amateur, and professional levels to learn, share, and collaborate in all aspects of building games. If you want more info, head over to our website at rockgamedev.com. If you've got an idea for a talk you'd like to give or a talk you'd like to see, let me know. You can find me at Sam underscore Camerata on Discord and Sam Catamaran on Twitter. Which brings us to tonight's talk, uh, Composer's Introduction to Video Game Music. You'll be joining composer John Peck, or Null Confluence, as you may have seen around on Discord, for an introduction to practical music production for video games. Learn how musicians and coders can collaborate on a video game soundtrack. We'll start by we'll start with pitching and portfolios along with game jams and networking then we'll talk through some of the tooling and standards you can expect for project work we'll explore iterative workflows effective communication and setting clear expectations finally preparing your soundtrack for mixing mastering and eventual release please feel free to drop any questions you have for uh john in chats as we go and with that i'll hand the mic over for the evening good evening my name is John Peck. Thank you so much for coming to Composer's Introduction to Video Game Music for Rock Game Dev. So who am I? Uh, my name is John Peck, also known as Null Confluence. Uh, I'm a musician, a software engineer, and an educator. Uh, I've done soundtracks and trailers for independent games and short films for over 20 years. Uh, most of my music is dark, introspective, and industrial-swired. Uh, usually with kind of like a techno or EDM and ambient types of influences. So tonight, we're going to be starting off with the introduction. We're going to go into tooling, uh, you know, about what types of things that you need to be using. Communication, you know, throughout the music production process and how do you communicate with game developers effectively. Uh, you know, how you actually deliver a, you know, final end product and uh, getting started with, uh, you know, if you're interested in actually doing this for real and final, wrapping it up with some final thoughts and trying to cap things off. So starting off, uh, who is this actually intended for? What is the role of music in video games? You know, how do you get music for video games, uh, including, you know, making it yourself, but what if you're not gonna be making it yourself? What if you're just a composer, uh, someone making a video game who needs music? You know, what are the components of a soundtrack and how do soundtracks relate to sound? So the intent of this course is to demystify the art of making music for games. This is intended for both musicians and for game developers. You know, it's focused on musicians. That is my background, but I also have a software engineering background. And so I'm trying to bridge this divide. So are you a person who makes their own music in any shape or form? Congratulations, you're a composer. The gate is open, come on in. There is no special initiation needed. You do not need to have a particular set of you know, skills or hardware or software. And that will be a theme running throughout this you know, session is this is intended to be inclusive. Like if you make your own music, you are a composer. So we'll just start right there. So what is the role of music in video games? It has a number of different purposes. It can be used to uh, set a tone in a setting. Like you hear music that reminds you of a particular area, gives you an idea. This is an urban setting. This is, uh, you know, this this is music that it will make you reminisce of the sea and so forth. You know, it'll be it can be used to set emotion. Like you know, it's like this is an intense moment. This is a happy moment. This is a wistful moment. This is anxiety. This is tension. This is a puzzle moment where you're trying to think things through. You know, there's something that will be kind of pushing you forward and giving you energy as you move forward. It can be used for emphasis. Like dun dun dun. Oh oh, this is a this is a moment that I need to be paying attention to. This is a, um you know something has just happened. It underscores something that is happening. It can be used as a storytelling device. Sometimes, uh, you know, people will sing. Sometimes people will be humming a tune. Sometimes there will just be a moment where they're looking off into the distance and reminiscing, and it's, it'll be, you know, part of the moment. Sometimes it will be literally part of the story with something like Crypt of the Necro Necrodancer, where you have a rhythm-based game where the music is literally the game. Uh, it can be just for backgrounds. You know, it's like something, again, bit putting, uh, giving you the context of where you are and, 
and giving you that kind of feeling of like uh, that fills in a gap that wasn't necessarily there. But I use the word fill and what shouldn't music be used for? Music shouldn't be used as filler. What does that mean? It's like having icing without cake or cake, you know, cake without icing. They're symbiotic. They work together. Uh, if you have, if you don't have a game or if you have just kind of a concept, just slapping music on top of it does not make it better. It just means that it's something that has music on top of it. It can still be in you know, hot mess and it can, you know, it can be like something that isn't necessarily appealing just because you add music to it does not make it better. It can enhance it. It can make it better. But if you're enhancing something that isn't good, it's still not good. So, you know, be mindful of like, you know, when, it, you know, the reasons why you want to add music to a project, you know, it helps make it complete. But if there isn't, if there isn't something to complete, focus on finishing, you know, you know, getting a more coherent gameplay structure in, into place. So, ways of getting music. Can I just download some music and use it? Uh, it depends on the licensing. And this can actually get you in a lot of trouble, so I would highly recommend paying attention here. Uh, if something is listed as public domain, it's free to use. Anybody can use it. You can download it freely. You can use it in the game. You don't even have to give attribution, but I think you should give attribution and make and mention where you're getting it. But if it's public domain, it's free for anybody to use and sell. Uh, if it's Creative Commons, you know, it has licenses that are open to use, uh, but it will usually come with limitations, such as share alike, meaning if you, you know, if the music was shared freely with you, you also have to share any derivative work from it. Attribution, meaning I got this music from so-and-so and I used it as part of my game and it's a credit somewhere within it. Or non-commercial, which means you can use this music as long as you don't sell whatever this you know, derivative work is, or as long as you're not selling your game. You know, you see a lot of uh, games on Itch, for example, that are freely distributed and are using Creative Commons music as well. If you purchase a license for you know, music, you know, either as part of a sound library or working with directly with an artist, fantastic. You can also get a, you know, work with an artist who can provide the music for free. Uh, purchase, I would say, acquire a license. You know, that's perfect. You've avoided all issues. What if you haven't bothered to do any of those things and you heard a hot single off YouTube music or Spotify or what have you, and it's unlicensed, you've, you know, you have an MP3 of it, you've downloaded it from somewhere, and, but you don't actually have permission from the artist. Will anybody notice? Maybe, maybe not. What if someone streams your game and gets hit with a copyright strike? What then? Who's responsible? Who's liable? You. What if you get sued if you sold a game with somebody else's music? That's a problem. It's not worth the risk. You know, it's not ethical, number one. That's the number one reason not to do it. But it's also, it's too big of a risk. I mean, it's like even, you know, if you're using it for a school project, that's a little bit different but i mean if you're actually going to be putting it in any type of like genuine public context you know find some music that is freely available you know there's all sorts of freely available you know creative common stuff uh you know free sounds you have public domain content there's a lot of legitimate ways that you can get music without using somebody else's license work so what are the parts of a game soundtrack yeah, this may seem a little bit derivative, but, you know, there's an actual point to this. You know, you have like a main theme for a game. You can have a menu. You're you're sitting at the menu and uh, sometimes that can also even be the main theme as well. Uh, and then it starts getting kind of game dependent. Like, you know, there can be an introduction. There can be individual levels and areas, each one of them with their own, you know, uh, sounds and music. There are different types of encounters, such as a fight or, you know, a conversation, uh, you know, a, a moment of tension, a discovery. Uh, you know, bosses could have individual music. In fact, uh, some, you know, some there's very famous works that are explicitly associated with a particular character or boss. And, you know, it's like when they're being introduced is like and it the music is part of the setting in which this person or creature or avatar or whatever is being presented to you. You know, death moments or defeat, you know, uh, you know, can have its own distinct music. You know, wah, 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 congratulations, you're, you're dead. Like, it enforces the idea that, you know, there's there's failure. And it kind of depends, honestly, on the game and the, you know, the individual game structure. You know, there can be credit music, you know, um, you know, something that is played, you know, well, as you're looking at, you know, who worked on the game. And trailer music, which can also just 
come from the game itself. You don't necessarily have to create uh, music specific for a trailer. Uh, you can, uh, but it can also be a fool's errand, especially if you already have strong music in the game and you want to show that off. This is, you know, and, and showing that this is actual part of the experience. And if you're making a pitch as well, like you might want to actually use music from the game so people can get a sense of what they're going to be getting into. So how does music relate to sound effects uh, in, in video games specifically? Uh, it, in my experience, and uh, it's best to make sure that they're complementary and and they're related to one another. Uh, complementary, you know, in the in the sense of they fit well together, and you know they're related, like it, uh, and sounding similar to each other. For example, if you have um, a 16-bit soundtrack, and then you know suddenly you're introducing some dubstep into it. It's like, that might sound kind of weird or, you know, having, uh, you know, having tones that are, you know, just very obviously clashing with one another, or just, you know, sounds like you just kind of like grab them randomly from free sound libraries that you found around that might not necessarily be the best idea. You know, try to create some cohesion between the two of them. Uh, I found that it's helpful to pick a key or related keys to the sound, you know, for a soundtrack. Um, this is not an original idea. Um, I, I will credit, uh, Belinda Coombs of, uh, Ring of Pain, uh, who, uh, who mentioned this to me as well. Um, they picked a particular key, uh, for the entire soundtrack and also pitched all the sound effects to it. So no matter what level it was on, the sound effects would work with the soundtrack. Uh, and pitching the sound effects as well. So they, you know, so they do complement each other. So they're not dissonant. So they're not clashing against one another and distracting you, uh, especially, um, it, and you don't have to be a musician to notice when something just doesn't fit. You know, um, if, you know, similar to Uncanny Valley, if you're looking at any type of visual medium, uh, if, when sound isn't fitting together and you just don't quite know why sometimes you might want to do that on purpose and you might want to be introducing that but it should be a conscious decision not because you're not thinking about it uh you know you're looking for harmony like doing it in um you know in, in a complementary way it should be consistent again um you know it's like you know the you know if something stands out it should be done for a very intentional reason it should be something that you're listening to over and over and over again uh, you should be trying to match the overall tone of, you know, of the sound effects, especially, you know, if the, you know, the game has been built uh, by the, it is partially built by the time you start working on it and there's ready placeholder sound effects, try to match the sound effects, you know, that are there or vice versa. If there is no sound effects and you create the soundtrack, then, uh, then whoever is working on the sound effects should be trying to match the overtone. Um, when creating a, a, a soundtrack, uh, as part of a game and also using a soundtrack in a game, you want to be avoiding boredom and same, sameness. You know, what does that mean? Background music can be distracting if you're paying too much attention. If, there's, if the themes are too strong, uh, if there's segments that, you know, it's like it gets repetitive. Like, you know, at first it's like, oh, that's a strong theme. I can really get into it. And then you hear it 80 times in a row. Yeah, you know, it's like, is that interesting? Is that, you know, is that really driving people, you know, forward? Or is it just going to frustrate them? Is that just going to be like kind of like one more piece of noise that they're going to turn, tune out or even turn off if it's, you know, if it gets obnoxious enough? And then they might, you know, miss the rest of the soundtrack because they got bored of like one repeated section over and over and again. Um, I found, you know, less is more. Like, you know, there are times that it makes sense to have a big bombastic introduction. Uh, but like, say like when you're running around in a level, uh, yeah, and, uh, you're in a level for say 10 minutes, do you want to hear the same minute 30 segment over and over again with like something that's really strident and it just keeps happening over and over again? Uh, that can also, you know, lend to a sense of frustration if you're stuck in a particular area and you keep hearing the same things and it's reinforcing. I was like, wow, I can't get past this. I'm a dope. Well, you know, having having that reinforcement of like, you can't get past this thing. Um, one way to fight that is randomization of segments. Um, you know, it's like it isn't necessarily making uh, a, a 10 minute track uh, or, or a 20 minute track to avoid that repetition. You can take, say, uh, a 10 minutes, you know, a track and chop it into two minute pieces or one minute pieces, even like five minutes and, you know, chop it into segments a b c d and e just you know and then you can randomize it play segment a and then b 
I'm sorry, C, then A, then B, then E, then D, and then do a new randomization and just kind of like keep slotting the pieces around, you know, you know with, with a crossfade. Avoid repeating the same segment, like don't play segment D and then do D immediately again. Like have a little bit of space, a little bit of logic in there. Um, you know, it'll take, you know, five minutes to implement that type of algorithm. It's like, here's the playlist, just randomize the playlist and 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 go through it. Uh, you don't have to go as far as Doom 2016 did, um, which had, you know, for every particular area, there was something like, you know, 15, 20, even 30 segments that were playing simultaneously, depending on what enemies were, you know, visible, whether or not they were paying attention to you, uh, how damaged you were, if you had any special effects, what... Uh, what weapons you had, you know, what environment you were in. There was so much different logic and it was absolutely awesome, rich soundtrack, but that was also a triple A production. Uh, if you're an indie, if you're just working on a game by yourself or with a, you know, small team, you don't have time for that. Like that's, you know, that's something to stretch for, but that's not something to do on your first outing or second outing or 20th outing even. Like, you know, it's like, don't start there. Stretch to, towards it, but don't don't start there. Uh, before, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I will continue on. If you have questions uh, throughout, feel free to throw them in the chat. Uh, I'm watching, and also um, Rock Game Dev can uh, break in and read things off to me if I've missed something. So uh, I will continue. Otherwise, there will be uh, questions at the end. Uh, next section I'm going to be talking about is tooling. Um, so you know, what kinds of tools do I need in order to make music? You know, to, you know what kinds of software? What kinds of hardware? And you know the overall question: What do you need to make music? You know, reductively, you need something with which to perform the music with. That can be an instrument. That can be yourself. That can be whatever. You know, um, that can you need something to record that performance, and you need something that can edit and save the result. It can all be the same tool. It doesn't have to be you know distinct things. You don't necessarily you know sometimes an all-in-one solution will work. Uh, do you need specific software to start making music? Well, need is a strong word. No, you actually don't need specific software to start making music. Will it help? Sure, maybe, kind of, it depends. It depends on what you need to do. There are lots of low cost and free ways to make music. You know, you don't necessarily need one particular software package that will magically anoint you as a video game composer. Uh, you can, you know, what you should be doing is taking an approach where you are learning tools in order to solve specific problems. You know, it's like, I need something that sounds like this. Find out what tool that takes. I need, you know, I need to edit sound in a particular way. I need to handle, you know, this particular situation, figure out the tools and techniques and learn those tools. But don't just go into it saying, I want to acquire tools, get gear. That does not make you a musician. That does not, you know, that just means that you have the ability to acquire things. So don't get or buy tools unless you explicitly need them. So what types of software should you consider? Uh, you could start off with a digital audio workstation. Um, you know, uh, there are uh, plenty of examples, including Reaper, which is, I find a very accessible way of learning multi-track audio it has, uh, I think, a 60-day trial, uh, and then it's uh, 50 or 60 dollars for a, for a license for effectively like many years. And there's also uh, educational discounts as well. Um, you know, FL Studio, or also known as Fruity Loops. Uh, there's Ableton Live Lite. There's GarageBand. There's Bitwig Studio 16 track. There's there is uh, my <laughs> the bath time for my daughters. Uh, there is the uh, Steinberg uh, Cubase LE. You know, each one of these has different advantages. Uh, you know, and uh, there's some of them are even free. You know, they're you know check you know check them out. You know, compare the different approaches. Some of it depends on the type of music that you're making. If, you know, for example, I make electronic music, and I you know so I go towards the Ableton Live Lite. If you have a Mac, you might already have GarageBand. GarageBand is a fantastic place to start, like experimenting, especially if you have instruments already that you wish to record at home. Fruity Loops is also fantastic if you want to like start tracking and make you know making your own music. You know. Uh, if you want to think about plugins, uh, you know, plugins can include synthesizers. So if you want to play a melodic line or you, know, you, you can include samplers, you know, things that will play back individual pieces of music or like a recording of a drum 
or sound effects or um or vo you know vocal samples or or loops and so forth you know you can have uh, effects such as echoes or reverb or compression and 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 so forth and then there are trackers uh, which is a you know different form of uh you know creating music something that was used extensively in both the 80s and the 90s going back to the amiga days and then you know uh, if you, soundtracks were things like you know the original unreal and unreal tournament and uh let's see dasex and and so forth all used a tracker based soundtrack and th those tools are still available today and are perfectly acceptable ways of creating music uh software synthesizers there's so many to choose from i mean like for example there's arteria pigments um uh, you know arteria makes a number of fantastic software synthesizers uh and emulations of actual uh physical hardware in addition to instruments such as pigments which are just you know straight up uh you know ground up synthesizers uh you know cherry audio also does a number of uh you know fantastic emulations and has its new dream synth which is a lot of fun kilo hearts has a you know has a great series of uh you know, plugins and effects, and also has uh, their uh, flagship synthesizer phase plant. Native Instruments uh, has a massive, massive library, uh, and massive is actually one of their um, synthesizer tools. There's both math massive and massive X, in addition to honestly like hundreds of different instruments that they that they have uh, with various licensing schemes. Transfer Records has Serum, which uh, if you're into electronic music, you probably you know heard of. There are thousands more. There is no one software synthesizer. There's no one magical thing that will, you know, that is going to uh, you know, get you going. Like, you know, these are just examples of you know, what are some of the more advanced digital audio workstations? Uh, there's Ableton Live Studio, uh, you know, which uh, you know, supports way more tracks, comes with, um, you know, many more instruments and plugins and samples and more and more and more and more. Uh, you know, Bitwig Studio, um, you know, basically has unlimited tracks and mixing. Steinberg Cubase Pro, Logic Pro, um, you know, Avid Pro Tools, if you want to you know, get like very heavily into like the editing side of it. You know, Adobe Audition, um, you know, a uh, fantastic multi-track editor also can be, you know, uh, you know, comes comes with a lot, has access to, you know, media libraries and, and organization. All these tools will absolutely work, but is it necessarily something that you need? Not necessarily. Do you need special hardware in order to start making music? No, you can actually use the hardware that you have now. I mean, even if you're walk, watching this on a phone, that is enough to start making music. I would recommend using a computer, but you can make actually very effective music on even just your phone. But, you know, stock hardware, you know, if you're watching on a PC or a Mac, uh, you know, specialized equipment is used to solve specific problems that you may not have when you're starting out. You don't have to start with speakers like studio, studio monitors. You don't have to go out and, you know, get like a really expensive pair of headphones, but a decent set of headphones does help. I mean, if you have like a, you know, $2 pair of Target headphones that you pick, you know, bulb headphones, maybe you want to get something a little bit better than that. But, you know, it's like, if it, if it sounds decent to you, if you can hear kind of like that full range of music uh, or, or sound, you know, you know, through them, you know, that, that works well. What hardware should you consider? So uh, I find it useful to have a MIDI controller. It's useful for playing notes like uh, like a piano or pads to trigger drums. You know, this is not necessarily stuff that, uh, notice I said consider, not require. Uh, your needs may be different. You know, having an audio interface, um, you, know, a set, you know, your computer sound card that is built into it will work just fine. Um, you know, uh, that's, you know, integrated into, you know, the computer. Uh, but if you need a dedicated uh, interface, like if you have uh, you're getting uh, sound from multiple sources simultaneously, then having a dedicated low latency, that means, uh, you know, uh, as soon as you hear a note, it is either recorded or played back simultaneously. Uh, a multiple channel, you know, hearing it in, in more than just like one or two, uh, you know, left and right. And audio input, output. Uh, a control service for controlling the digital audio workstation. You can, you know, there's very fancy systems that you can get for, you know, starting at 50, you know, 50 bucks all the way to it's like tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, there's, you know, if you want to make uh, music using a synthesizer for making sounds without a computer, there you can get standalone synthesizers. A microphone, such as the one that I'm using now uh, to talk to you for recording voices and live instruments. 
Uh, you can go to a field recorder if you want to be recording ambience uh, or sound effects or Foley, or like actually going out, you know, you know literally to uh, a different location and getting a sound effect or recording a sound of uh, children dropping things on the ceiling. So what are the primary tools that I use? Uh, I have a digital audio workstation. Uh, for composition, I'm using Ableton Live Studio. Uh, for editing and workflow, I'm using Reaper. I think it's you know fantastic for doing kind of like session you know session based audio and like something that is focused on either a particular you know sound or collection of sounds. Uh, you know uh, for electronic music workflows, is, which is what I specialize in. I found that Ableton Live Studio works well for me. That's not what I started off with. I started off with uh, uh, acid, uh, Sony Acid uh, back in the day and uh and a number of other tools in that universe uh for control surface uh, i have both an ableton push one um which has a bunch of pads on it that i use to trigger ableton live and also um for scene selection and so forth uh i also have a korg nano control too you know one of those low cost uh midi controllers that has uh eight faders and eight knobs that i can use for padding and you know some basic transport controls it's not not particularly fancy but it's utilitarian it works for me um for a midi controller i have an Arturi, uh, arturia key lab mark 261 uh you could have an 80 88 um uh, key keyboard i have one upstairs but it's you know i use that for practicing not necessarily for composition uh you could have a one octave or a two octave keyboard it's fine you know it's like whatever works you know fits your particular workflow um there's there's no prescriptive solution and i'm describing this basically this is the setup that i have uh for speakers i have a pair of mackie crx five inch monitors i got them off amazon you know they're less than a you know i i think i got they were used i think for around a hundred dollars you know they were you know, you do not necessarily need something that is massively fancy or expensive. Uh, for an audio interface, I have a Focusrite Scarlett A18 in, 20 out, um, but that's also reflective of the workflow. It, I got it specifically to solve the problem of communicating with multiple synthesizers simultaneously, sometimes recording with multiple musicians. And uh, uh, yeah, it solved a particular problem that I needed. So speaking of communication, here's a bunch of cables. So uh, when you're working on a project, uh, you are likely not the only person working on it. You can be, and if you are, this will also be helpful. You know, so how do you coordinate with the team? How do you have coherent conversations about the workflow, about the things that you're going to be doing in association with the soundtrack? What are the various production stages of you know producing music and also like within the game itself? You know, how do you iterate and get feedback as you're working on the game? So. Coordinating with a team, you know, start, you know, uh, I find it useful to have a running chat. If you, you know, for example, Discord or Slack or Yammer, if you want to go into some corporate universe, or IRC if you're <laughs> hardcore, uh, Discord, Slack, or equivalent. Um, having a dedicated channel uh, for music or composition helps uh, instead of like you know dumping it into game dev or like some kind of like general chatter, just so you can kind of like separate out the conversation and get focused feedback and iterate there. Uh, for task management, uh, having a shared doc or spreadsheet is useful, like Google Docs, you know, works just fine. You can also go a little bit more formal with an issue tracker like Trello, if you want to go Kanban, Asana, uh, if you're going with something more agile, uh, GitHub and GitLab, uh, which are source control management systems, uh, both have built-in issue trackers or equivalent. There's no one solution, you know, it's like, what's a workflow that kind of like works for everybody? You know, what's something that you can track the progress of a particular task is it like is this ready to go is this blocked by something you know what are the needs of it and uh you know seeing it through to completion you know um for the individual uh you know for an individual task like what are the requirements like what is this sound you know it's like this is a title you know what is the mood of this is this going to be you know something that is exciting is this something electronic is this something that you know you know, what does this, you know, what kind of emotion am I trying to create? You know, who is in the scene? You know, what is the setting going to be? You know, for project management, you know, um, you are the person who is controlling your personal workflow. You may, you are probably going to be interfacing with somebody else who has a different workflow or, you know, maybe sharing the same workflow. It's up to you, but you need, you are the person who is in control of like how you do things. And in this case, you are the specialist. And so people will rely on you to provide you know, kind of like structure and expectations. 
you know, work within your team's workflow, um, you know, be easy to work with um, and make sure that like, you know, you're not making other people jump through particular hoops in order to get things in a nicely packaged way. Sometimes you will have to adapt, you know, to their work style and they, you know, they'll, they make, they may give you an ad hoc request over Slack and then you'll take that and you know, actually create some formal requirements for yourself or like, you know, have one place for your notes and just, you know, have it organized like that. Um, something that is really useful is asking for comparisons when, you know, somebody wants a sound or wants music for a particular section, they usually have an idea of what they want to hear or can give you examples of something that sounds similar. Uh, placeholder music, which can include something that is commercial, uh, you know, or an inspiration playlist is a fantastic place to start. It's like, I want something that sounds like, I don't know, Jack White. I need something that sounds like Mick Gordon's Doom. I need, I need something that sounds like Inception. You know, whatever, whatever that inspiration may be, you know, that will set a tone. You, you know, it, it can be commercial. It can be licensed. You know, uh, if you're going to actually put it into the game, don't ship it with a game ever, like, make, you know, make sure it's squeaky clean. But, like, if you're just trying to rough things in and, like, get kind of, like, a sense of where something is, it's like, what if I have, like, a really big bombastic opening? What does that sound like? And you put in a placeholder and you're like, that really doesn't work. Okay. Well, at least you went through that instead of going through, like, a whole production cycle where, you know, somebody asked somebody to make music. They spent hours upon hours in creating something, and then it's put in, and you're like, nope, that's not what I want. So placeholder music is great for setting that tone uh, and for determining the tone and the feeling. And it starts the conversation and saves that time, you know, because rather than saying it's like, I need title music. I'm like, cool. Like, what? You know, what, you know, what, what's the title? What's, what's credit music? What's good credits music to you? Cause your idea of what some, what might fit will be different than what might fit for me. Um, when somebody gives you a comparison, like a placeholder music or something for inspiration, don't make a sound like you are your own composer. You are making your own thing. It can be inspired. It can be done in a similar style. You know, it's like, if it's like, okay, that's industrial. I'm going to make something that is also industrial. It doesn't have to sound exactly the same, but like if it's going to have a similar emotional tone, if I'm going to make something that is inspirational and twee and, you know, has a ukulele in it, like, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to do that type of, you know, you know, soundtrack and style. And I can, you know, I don't have to do something at the same tempo or having the same vocalization or even the same instruments, but like, here's the emotion that this is producing and I'm going to produce something that has a similar type of emotion. At the end of the day, this is your composition, not theirs. So what are the basic stages of music production? You know, it starts with an idea, a description of whatever the context is like, you know, uh, and what the goals are, you know, for example, it's like, I need introduction music for a grass, you know, grassland that sounds like, I don't know, Alice's restaurant, whatever. Uh, having a demo, uh, you know, just kind of an early version of it. The musician sits down and says, oh, okay, I'm going to kind of like sketch something out like musically either, you know, so I've literally hummed things out or just play it on a, you know, uh, with a couple kind of like good enough instruments, not a final thing, but just like, yeah, this kind of like gets the idea of a cross, you know, and is done quickly. Um, you know, and it's not something that you would release, you know, for the public to hear, but you know, it's like, this is enough. You know, think like make the musical equivalent of a post-it note that you've scribbled on. You know, it's like, does this work for you? And then, you know, having something tangible that you can actually listen to will give you that feedback. And, uh, you know, other people can use it and put it into the game and say like, yeah, that doesn't really work. Yeah. Um, and then start versioning, like have iterations toward that final vision, like, because you will get feedback. And it was like, I like it. Keep run with that. Like, I don't like it. Here's what needs to change. If someone just says it sucks, I'm like, that's not good feedback. That's there's nothing actionable about it. Like, you know, but once you are getting like feedback that can actually like tell you in the, you know, you know, what direction to go is like, ah, uh, I'm looking for something angrier. It should have more, like more trap sounds in it. You know, uh, you know, it would be great if there was an or orchestral swell, you know, something or like, uh, I like the direction where you're going. Have you considered also adding this other thing? You know, so each di different version will be iterating towards a final version or a vision. You know, it's like whatever like that end goal is. Um, how many versions, uh, I've done like 10 or 12 versions at a time. That's not sustainable. Usually it's like two or three, you know? Um, yeah, it's like, sometimes it's one, sometimes I nail it the first try not too often. Usually it's just kind of like, yeah, that's nice. Like, you know, um, and 
by the way, just a side note, it's not a slide. Um, keep all your versions, keep them around, uh, especially if you end up going in a radically different direction. Uh, something that you make for one project can absolutely slot into a different project or you just be like, eh, here's a compilation like B-sides and stuff that I made, you know, for fun. And like, I like this track. It didn't end up in the final game, but like, I like it. So, you know, I can use it for whatever because I made it. That's the joy of creation. So um, when you have a version, um, get it in the game and listen to it in context, make sure it's working. Um, you know, you know, then you get to kind of like the raw stage. The overall sun song is done, but it's lacking polish. And when I say polish, I'm talking about mixing, you know, the formal process of mixing where the sounds are combined and balanced and mastering, which includes equalization, compression, and optimizing sound translation. Now, both of those are more advanced concepts. And those are things that not necessarily everybody needs to do. Um, you know, you can't, I don't know, I'll talk about those two in a little bit greater detail. So is mixing and mastering required for a game? Uh, kind of, but like for a small indie game, you can kind of do it yourself. Like basically like what you're doing is like listening to it on multiple sets of speakers. Like, does it sound kind of consistent? Are things kind of muddy or is it like kind of mixed? Can I hear everything that I want to hear? You know, listen to it on your phone. Is it coherent on your phone? Because like maybe you have the best set of studio monitors or you know an excellent set of speakers and it sounds fantastic and then you listen to it on your phone and you can't hear snot like you know your phone is a great equalizer like you know uh listening to it on a car radio is another you know great trick there don't rely on your nice headphones or speakers you know make it sound good enough to you you know it's like you're the audience and you're going to be probably one of your more harsher critics um uh, unless you're probably going to be one of your more harsher critics so make it sound good enough to you and then, you know, and then put it in account. Yeah. You know, if you actually go down a formal mixing and mastering uh, road, you can do that uh, and getting somebody professional to do that. And that will cost, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to do, um, you know, for an entire project. Is that worth it? Uh, well, is this like a triple A game? No. Is this just like an indie game that you're putting out, um, you know, on your own? And uh, maybe if it's a hit, then you can invest back into it and do a formal release. Yeah, then it makes sense. Um, but if you're just trying to get something out there, do it yourself. Again, this is like, a you know, a, a, a case of like learn the tools well enough to get something accomplished. You know, it's worth it if you have the budget. If you don't, don't bother. So the actual act of delivery you know, it's like when, you know, it's like, how do you, you, we've talked about the workflow and process, but okay, now you have these files that are going back and forth. How do you deal with that? So like, what types of standards are used in game audio, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, music for video games? You know, how do you transfer files back and forth? You know, what is actually on a soundtrack, a formal soundtrack, not just like the parts of the game itself, but like if you want to release an OST uh you know how do you license and sell your music so delivery standards um you know so uh always start you know it's like when you've created kind of like that raw sound or something that is intended for the game always start with uncompressed sounds you know with wave for windows or aiff for mac um you know 48 8 uh kilohertz and 24 bit is more common 44.1 and 16 bit is an older standard uh, if you if you remember CDs that's the that's the standard for CDs you know uh you can go higher um you know is that all, you know will that make your music better not necessarily could you sure will it take more space yeah is it going to be harder to work with yeah find a balance that works for you can you go lower yeah but don't just straight up don't like um you know find find something that is a decent balance uh always store them permanently somewhere you know where where's what's a permanent place don't put them on a cd uh you know putting them on a hard drive can work but like you know hard drives do crash um and putting them in the cloud is honestly like a better place if you know where it is um you know when do you start getting into compression uh you don't have to but you can if you're compressing it uh it does make the file say smaller but it needs to be decompressed at runtime, which makes that, you know, startup slower. Uh, Og Vorbis is the you know, best uh, uh, format if, you're, uh, if the game's target is uh, a desktop. Uh, MP3 is best for mobile, um, but you don't have to use either of those. Uh, you can, be, uh, some, some engines, Unity can also, uh, you know, do some optimization for particular targets. You know, actual file delivery. Um, 
you saw, uh, I prefer using something like uh, Google Drive or Box or et cetera. Don't use Mega, you know, use use something that you can actually have a subscription to. Um, you know, are you using Git with GitHub, GitLab or others? Um, source control, you know, uh, Git is an SEM is absolutely fantastic if you're doing source code management. Uh, these are binary files. Uh, and binary files are not actually built for source code management, which is great for doing diffs of, well, frankly, text files. And uh, so it can store them, but it's uh, it uh, as soon as you know, as soon as you have multiple versions of the same file, each one of them will be stored separately, and that makes the the overall history gigantic. That's not worth it. You know, instead, you should be using LFS support, large file support uh, that's built into both GitHub and GitLab. They I. Uh, they, uh, you need to configure uh, your Git client, you know, explicitly to use it. But it's, uh, you know, it's like once you have that in place, then it stores the, you know, it's only storing the metadata of the file as part of the Git history, and then it stores the file itself separately. And so, um, effectively, um, it's it, it has the same impact as like just saving them in a folder on on your hard drive as opposed to like ha saving every single distinct version of it, which can obviously add up and make diffs absolutely atrocious. So if you want to prepare your music for a soundtrack uh, or an OST, this is a little bit different than you know what's gonna be in a game. Uh, when when you're in a game, you are telling a story with your music. It is, you know, it is a journey, but you know, you you don't necessarily have control, especially if it's more open ended game. You know, the the order of playback is based on the context of which you are consuming the music. When you're listening to a soundtrack, that's more of a linear experience. I mean, you can pick and choose, but like, you know, if you're actually putting together as an album, you're going to be telling a story. So if there's any loops, they need to be unraveled. Like, you know, it's like there needs to be a beginning, middle and end. It needs to actually go somewhere as opposed to just being like this, you know, blop of music and sound like, you know, it was like, how do you get into it? Like, you know, um, you can do it. You can do it just a hard stop or just fade in you know, and fade out like you could, but like, eh, you know, genuinely, like, who's your audience at that point? Um, not everything that you make for a soundtrack is a good candidate. Like, you know, maybe you made like some elevator music, you know, it's like, you know, Ed, that's, you know, intended to be kind of humorous and, you know, girl from Eponina, do, 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 you know, something, you know, something like that where you can make people, you know, play that trope off. Is that like really best representative of your music or is just kind of like a throwaway joke in the middle of the game? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if it, if it's not a fit, don't include it. Um, you know, the soundtrack itself should tell a story. I mean, there's an introduction, there is the title screen and there are the various levels, but it should progress. It should be like, you know, um, you know, for example, uh, I'll use bring a pain again. Uh, you know, it starts off, everything gets, you know, is happy. And then as you descend, things get more intense and, and, uh, and there's evolutions and it becomes this, you know, you know, darker thing that, you know, by the time you get to the boss, like, you know, the music has evolved along with the rest of the game. And so, you know, in a similar way, uh, not everything needs to descend, but like it should go somewhere. You know, it shouldn't just be, you know, you shouldn't just kind of like lay back and experience it and just like have it be like, OK, it started, it's ended. Like, you know, what is the journey that you're trying to, you know, to convey um, stories? you know, can be summarized and so can a soundtrack. Uh, you don't necessarily need the 10 minute version of your track. What if, you know, like only like four minutes of it, like really like makes sense and it's interesting and compelling. You know, it's like, um, it's, you know, how can you compose something that will keep you know people's attention and summarize it in a way that conveys the actual meaning? Uh, and, Finally, every note that you write does not have to be commemorated. Um, yeah, there's that uh, just because you have made something does not mean that it's perfect. And that does not necessarily mean that it has to be shared. Um, you know, so it's OK. Like, it's like every good writer has a good editor, like standing behind them and going like, uh-huh, uh-huh, like get to the point, like focus. You know, you're not just like looking for that kind of like rubber stamp. What is the best of the thing that you've created? You know, what will give people the most complete experience um, that is appropriate to that medium?
So what if you want to license your music? What if you want to sell it? Uh, it depends on the project and publisher. Um, you know, it's like uh, some, you know, some projects, like if you are, uh, if you're just doing this by yourself um, or you, it, uh, you've licensed it to like, you know, something on itch and uh, or, you know, it's it's up there. It's on a, on a game. They're not selling it. You know, it's like, oh, OK, I'm going to, you know, there, you can just sell it freely. But what if uh, you know, if you're working for the particular publisher, there may be agreement of like how that soundtrack will be handled. You know, um, you know, think of like what your time is worth. You know, um, you know, if you were if you are creating music, if you were doing this for hire, um, you know, some people charge a hundred dollars to five hundred dollars per minute of produced music. You know, that sounds like a lot, but how long does it take to get it to that point that is effectively mixed and mastered and like gone through like those various iterations and is kind of like that final product that can you listen to? You know, it takes a long it, it can take a long time to get to that point. Um you know, it's like, oh, you can do it for free. Like, you know, it's like, oh, if your name's on the product, uh, it's like, you can, you know, it's like, you're doing it for exposure. Exposure is something you can die from. Yeah. <laughs> In that, you know, if you need money, you should be compensated. You know, that whole kind of like, no, you pay me. Uh, yeah, it's like, your time is worth something. If you're doing this for fun as a hobby and you have a day gig and you are not necessarily relying on making music uh, in order to, you know, pay the bills, to pay rent, um, then, you know, maybe you can afford, you know, those opportunities for exposure. But is it explo exploitation at that point? Yeah, uh, you were you were the judge, but remember to value yourself as you're having these conversations with both yourself and anybody, any potential business partners. Um, my preference is you keep your rights, but license it to people. Um, not everybody is going to want that. Um, you know, some people will want to get the rights outright and they will give you, you know, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, you know, but like you can keep the rights, but license it like for a percentage or royalty or like a one-time payment, like, you know, you give me $5,000 and you can use it for whatever. Or, you know, it's like, uh, you know, 10% of sales, you know, whatever you work out with the individual or, or if it works out better if you're the one you know, creating the game as well. Uh, you can also sell all the rights for one-time payment. Um, you know, this is actually very common in a number of different contexts, especially if you start working, uh, you're doing spec work for somebody like Netflix, for example, it's like they will give you a one-time payment and you will, you know, maybe, you know, the show will be a hit or not, but you still got the same size check. Uh, it's a guaranteed payout, payout, but a runaway success pays the exact same as commercial failures. So you are more, you know, um, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like if you did the soundtrack to, I don't know, Squid Games or something like that. Um, yeah, it's like, that was a runaway success, but like if you if that if that soundtrack was created on spec, then that then the composer got paid exactly the same. Uh, you could also just release it for free, uh, and that's an option too as well. Like you know, thinking you know, going down down that creative comments. If you're just happy to make the music and you're just like, yeah, put it out there, you, know, you should still license it. Um, otherwise, you know, people will abuse it, and even if you do license it, like using something like Creative Commons non-commercial, um, people can abuse it. That won't prevent it, but you know, ethical people won't do it. Um, what are the places to sell a soundtrack? Um, yeah, you, know, you can use Steam and Epic and GOG, uh, good old games. <laughs> you know, all, all have those built into the platforms. Some of them will do it as a DLC or sometimes uh, we'll do it as a separate product. Uh, Bandcamp is a very common one, um, which I guess Bandcamp should probably now be organized under Epic. This slide was written before Epic bought Bandcamp, so which I have mixed feelings about. Uh, but the nice thing about Bandcamp is that it's an artist direct you know, uh, site as well. Uh, there are sites like Banzoogle, which will give you, um, you know, as part of band, uh, site hosting, it'll also you know, give you the opportunity to put your music up and sell it. Uh, SoundCloud is a very common place. Um, you can host it just for listening. It, uh, I find it fantastic for demos and portfolios. You can also put music up there to sell uh, and publish to other platforms. Uh, you know, if there's they have a subscription plan, if you use it, you, know, you can actually get that, you know, get your music up onto Spotify and iTunes, Yandex Music or what have you. Um, you know, TuneCore, DistroKid, CD Baby, SongTrust, those are all other platforms uh, that, that you can use as, you know, publish, publishing aggregators to other platforms. And also, as CD Baby implies, you can also get, you know, physical medium uh, printed of that. 
even though what year is it, you know, do you really want physical medium? Well, it depends on your audience. You know, uh, do people have, you know, do people who listen to your music, you know, do they have something that they want to listen to? Maybe you do want to have a thousand copies of a, on vinyl, but are you actually going to sell it? Maybe not on day one. Uh, and also, um, you know, those uh, perform, uh, uh, actually, that and SoundCloud uh, have opportunities for you know doing more formal licensing and like tracking you know um, you know so you know um, you know similar to RIA and and so forth like knowing when music has been consumed on other platforms like you know having like a YouTube content ID and so forth. So, um, you know, to summarize, uh, when you're working on a project you should set some clear expectations, including like what the delivery standards are, like, you know, what types of files you're going to be, you know, giving, going back and forth, you know, having some kind of centralized communication, like, you know, it's like, uh, like, you know, be it that Slack or, you know, Discord channel, you know, be it an email address, be it in, um, you know, uh, you know, social media, whatever, however you were communicating, like know at least where it is so you don't have to take disparate pieces and consolidate into one place. You know, when are you working? You know, it's like maybe maybe you have a day gig and like you're only working from, I don't know, nine until midnight. You know, maybe you're working regular business hours. You know, maybe you're only working on the weekends, like whatever that is, you know, you know, depending depending on the project, you might be working with somebody who's in a different time zone, like figure out like, you know, what the regular hours are and set those expectations. You know, how long it may take, um, you know, especially if, uh, you know, it's like, it's one of those things that you only learn by doing, you know, um, it's like you, you can, you know, the more you, more you set out like a goal for yourself, it's like, it's going to take me three hours to come up with two minutes worth of music that I like, you know, or four minutes, like, you know, you can eventually like by, by giving yourself kind of like pro, you know, mini projects, you can kind of like dial that in and just learn it by experience, similar to coding as well, like coding, um, you know, it's dependent on your knowledge and, and the task at hand and the code base that you're doing it in. But, you know, over time, you get better at estimation. And so, you know, it's like set a clear expectation. It's like, hey, I need six tracks. I like, I need it by Monday. I'm like, I can't do that. Like, I, I don't have the time, but like, you need it two weeks from now? Yeah, I can do that. You know, um, set a clear expectation there. And compensation, like, how are you going to get paid? Are you going to get paid? Is that, is that even part of the equation? You know, um, you know, if you were not going to get paid, uh, put some strict limits on it. Like, I'll do this for free, but you can't sell it. Or maybe you can sell it. Like, you're feeling, per, you know, particularly al altruistic. That's up to you. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but sure, if you want to, you know, if you want to give your stuff away for free, you can. Um, you know, credit. Um, you know, that doesn't need, need to say that, like, you know, this game here, music by so-and-so but you know you should have like on the title page maybe you want um like on the website you want to link to your website you know you want to have that kind of cross promotion it was like it'd be nice if i had a shout out on the um social media like linking to you know my social media and so forth you know uh in licensing you know it's like um are you you know what are the licensing expectations like are they buying the music for you outright and they can do whatever they want with it are you licensing it to them are you giving them permission to use the music um you know what context can they use it in uh you know can they stream it um you know freely can they sell their own copies of it like you know figure figure out what that looks like so if you want to get started um you know uh in in the you know it's like how do you build like a portfolio how do you build a presence you know what's collaborative conduct when you're interacting with communities and other people um how do you network how you know you know what's the role of game jams uh and uh and also uh some thoughts on redesigns as well so uh if you want to get started you know doing you know making music for video games identify like what your inspirations are you know it's like who are the people who make the soundtracks that you like? You know what? What are what are some examples of them? How do they represent themselves? Like you know, uh, online in social media, in you know, interviews and what have you. Uh, you know, what is their process like? What is their tooling like? You know, um, you know, it's like first, you know, just start like thinking around like what those people are and what the characteristics are like. You know, when you are presenting yourself online, you know, what types of things should you have in a game audio portfolio? You should have your name. Who are you? Uh, I go by Noel Confluence, but I also, you know, John Peck is on there as well. It's like, this is me. This is how I identify myself. I'm trying to like have that 
cake and eat it too. But like a lot of, uh, you know, people who make, uh, or who are composers just go by their name, you know, and the, there's no, yeah, it, it's just, this is who I am. Um, having a short description of what you do in styles. I'm experimental. I go off in all these different directions. Pick three. You know, it was like, you know, it's like, it, it's reductive, but like, uh, the more verbose you are, the more people's eyes are going to cross. And they're going to like just tune you out. You know, what is, you know, having a sizzle reel, like, you know, what is the most important types of things? You know, it's like, what, what is the, uh, right. Uh, what are the most compelling p things that you have done? You know, what is the most exciting? What, like, what is most representative of your style? It does not have to be long, but it's like, get to the point, like something like two, two and a half, three minutes long, like, uh, or you can even be like 60 seconds if you just want to just like, bam, wham, bam, holy mac, or what was that? I want to learn more, you know, something like really quick to grab their attention. And then like, you know, what is the um, best of your work? You know, have like a, a couple style or mood examples of like you know this you know this is representative of my style having a list of the works that you have um you know this is where you can you know this is not the same as like uh listing every single track but like you know what are the major works that you've done that you've done uh recommendations if you have anybody if like um you know if someone has uh, given you a testimonial it's like so and so is easy to work with or like i've it was a joy collaborating on the soundtrack to the foo thing you know whatever that may be uh, and then uh, a brief bio, like, you know, who are you? Uh, and an emphasis on brief, you, you know, you are not writing an autobiography here. It's just like, eh, I've been doing this for X, you know, X amount of time. I'm inspired by these things and I like cookies, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, where would you like to, uh, where's a good place to put your portfolio? Um, you can use Google Sites, you know, um, which is free. You can use Squarespace, which is commercial. WordPress sites also work. You know, Banzoogle, I, I personally use that one. Um, you know, it's a, you know, it's built for artists um, and it's easy to manage. My day job, honestly, is working with content management systems and I would much rather actually delegate that particular responsibility than um, spending all my time maintaining a website. So it's easier for me to just use a service that um, I can put my content in there. Um, you know, what is your brand presence? Like, who are you and how do people know about you? You know, it's like, uh, I found that it's effective to develop your own brands and reputation by participating. What does participation mean? You know, it's like, that means actually like, you know, going out, giving talks like this, um, like working with other people, collaborating in game, game jams, actually like having those conversations, putting yourself out there and being an actual part of and a member of a community. Um, you know, having an email that is like something that is a little better than farts, LOL, 420 at hotmail.com, like have something a little bit more professional, like your name or whatever. It can be a Gmail. It doesn't really matter or hotmail. Um, but you know, have something that is a little bit classier than that. Um, you know, uh, if you're using social media, using a hashtag, like, uh, hashtag game audio, uh, works well. It's a, it's a good shorthand and it can actually get you looped into other conversations about other people talking about similar types of things. Uh, you know, you can use that across, you know, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, like so all around there. Uh, having a presence on SoundCloud or equivalent, you know, having a place where you can, you know, post your music, listen to music that other people have, you know, listened to. And that's that kind of like, you know, it's not just like the li like and subscribe. No, actually, like if you hear music that other people make, comment on it, you know, say, you know, say that you like it, engage with them. And, you know, listen to them, maybe make some suggestions and follow them and maybe they'll follow you back. Maybe they don't. Who knows? You know, but, you know, it's like the more you engage, the more that you can build that audience, you know, you know, built an audience and also get feedback. And like, you know, maybe down the road, you want to do a collaboration with someone or just get get their feedback or like maybe they just make music you enjoy, you know, engage with them, um, you know, participate on Discord or other chat servers. Um, you know, rock game dev is obviously a pretty obvious choice there, but there's others such as game dev network, which is a, you know, international system beats to play games too, is another fantastic, uh, discord server, um, that I like, uh, and it's a great place to learn from other professionals who are talking about the, you know, not only the art, but the business of making music and giving you, uh, uh, and having those real world conversations with peers and talking about shop frankly um you know collaborative conduct like how should you you know 
um, how should you conduct yourself? Participate in discussions. Don't just be a wallflower. I mean, do start off and listen, but you know, uh, also offer input, you know, appropriately. Read the room. Know what people are talking about. Like, don't just come in there charging and saying like, oh, I know better than this, or I am starting off, so therefore, like, you know, people should give me help. Like, no. Like, see what the conversation is and participate. You know, maybe like gingerly, like, but get yourself in there. Uh, piece by piece observe before you weigh in listen then participate don't you know don't just barge in and assume you know offer other people assistance especially if like someone's like hey can i get help with this thing and be like i would love to help you and and you know do that if you know how to help them or at least like find them a resource connect them even if you're even if you don't know how to do a thing like i can't do that but so and so can and make that connection and you'll be remembered favorably for that and you've helped somebody along the way and they'll be more likely to help you when you are in need and give feedback like if someone like posts a track listen to it say i like that i didn't like that you know here's you know it's like um you know you know like here's uh, I, you know, here's the things that were enjoyable. Like, wh how, what would you like somebody to say about your own work? Say that about theirs, you know, give them the time of day, you know, uh, and like, if you give, you can receive as well. You know, don't just advertise and spam yourself. Like, you know, uh, it's tempting. Um, you know, especially like if things are quiet it's like, you know, you, I mean, there is a moment of introduction. There are times that you like do need to talk about yourself, but the conversation is not just always about you and it shouldn't just be about you. You know, it should be about other things. What else is on your mind? What tools are you using? What, what techniques are you using? What is exciting to you? Uh, meetups and net networking. Um, yeah, uh, a little bit hairier in the time of COVID, but here we are. Um, you know, it's like uh, in game audio uh, in particular, I, I found like who you know is invaluable. Um, you can know them virtually as well as in person. Um, as, you're, as you're meeting people, like work on your, your elevator pitch. Like, who are you? You know, what do you do? You know, an elevator pitch is like a 30 second memorable description of what you do. Um, you know, it's like practice it. Like, just like, it's like, hi, my name is John Peck and I make industrial ambient music for video games. Yeah, there's, that's a short version. You know, it's like, you can like rip that off and you're like, what do you do? And you're like, this is what I do. Um, you know, have an answer for that. Like, you know, what makes you interesting? You know, if you're in person, like sometimes having a business card, even though that's not may seem a little bit hokey, is tangible. And uh, like sometimes so people will like, you know, uh, be tapping around on their phones that may work for them. That may may want um, having a business card will actually stand out a little bit in that, you know, you can get them really cheap and they can slip it in their pocket. And that's actually, you know, if you talk to 10 people and only one person has a business card, you will at least give a second look to that business card. Uh, game jams are a fantastic way to participate, you know, for fun or for competition. Um, for example, uh, seven day, uh, first person shooter or London dare are big, uh, game jams, a lot of fun. In fact, uh, like some, some of the bigger project that I'm working on started off as a seven day first person shooter, uh, game jam entry, you know, make music for entries. Um, you know, it's like, it's great practice. Um, you know, it's an opportunity for networking. You can add it to your portfolio. Um, you know, it's like, you know, enjoying the jam discord. This is like more opportunities for you to interface with other people in the industry that you are interested in and other musicians as well. Find a team, you know, this is like, you know, some of that is that kind of like pitch or, you know, pitching yourself as like, hi, my name is John Peck and I make music. And here's an example of it. Some of the resources that you can use, uh, if you're looking for game jams, you can, uh, itch.io has a huge list of jams. Uh, GameDeveloper.com, if you go look for their Game Jam Survival Kit, also uh, it gives a fantastic introduction to what Game Jams are like and how you can participate in like, some places where you can find, find them as well. So how can you cold pitch? Uh, you can have a short introduction, you know, why you're interested in the project. You know, sorry, a cold pitch is like when somebody hasn't reached out to you, you are reaching out to them. So like, hi, my name is John. I make game audio. I'm interested in your project because I don't know. I like the things that are in it. You know, um, Frank Zappa, uh, the musician, had a way that he would interview people for his band. And he would just ask them, it was like, what can you do? That's fantastic. And it sets an expectation that you're going to do something incredible, but also like, you know, kind of like encapsulates the idea of like, you know, it's like, what makes you special? You know, what, you know, why are you interested? It's like, I make this kind of like thing, like what is, you know, what is works really well. Uh, one thing you can do is score a video that they already have if they posted like a video of the project. 
uh, and then be prepared to iterate, um, you know, on the spot. Uh, and what this, you know, what this video here is, uh, I'm actually, I'm kind of curious how the sound is going to work here, but this is a real world pitch that I did for uh, seven day FPS. Uh, someone had posted a video of their game. And uh, so I scored it like on the spot and then sent it to him. And of course there's no sound because reasons. All right, well, um, I'll, I'll, I will link to it later. Um, but you know, it was like, it was the game and I was playing, I played my music and then I at the very end, just like, here's this pitch soundtrack linked to myself done. And that worked. Um, that got their attention and, yeah, and the, and the conversation that, you know, immediately started was kind of like, ah, oh, that wasn't exactly what I'm thinking. Ah, but that gives me an opportunity to say, okay, you know, what were you thinking of? And you gave it another sound of like, I sent something back and it was like, eh, not exactly. I was thinking something more like goblin, uh, any goblin and Suspiria. I'm like, oh, okay. And then did like the third demo is like that I did. It was like, okay, let's talk. And, you know, and we actually like, you know, started collaborating at that point, but that like that kind of like cold pitch, like the thing, like to get their attention, you know, do something that's fantastic that will get their attention. Redesigns are another thing that uh, I've seen people doing um, and I have mixed feelings about. Um, you know, it's when you are making your own music or sound for an existing game, you know, usually like a video or, or, or something. It's like, you can do it over like gameplay or like for a trailer. And so, you know, it's like, this is good practice, but, 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 but the reason why this drives me up the wall is because people conflate this a lot. Be very, very clear about your role. You know, if you is like, oh, here is my redesign of uh, Breath of the Wild, at least you're saying it's a redesign. It's like, here's my music for Breath of the Wild. That's disingenuous. Yeah, that oh, that conflates your role, which if you did not actually have a personal role in the development of a game, don't imply that you did. Make make it very clear that this is, is a redesign. Uh, don't pretend that you actually worked on the project um, as a... Um, I would not hire somebody who did that. Um, also another thing, uh, especially like as you're beginning, beginning, you do not have to take every project. In fact, you shouldn't, um, you know, it's like, what is the project's vision? Is that aligned with something that you want to do? You know, um, you know, it's like, you know, what if, uh, you know, the pro, you know, the game is like something that is kind of like anime inspired and you are doing something that is like doom metal, like that doesn't fit, you know, um, uh, it's like, I, you know, it's like, I, I really need like this upbeat chirpy soundtrack. I'm like, I just can't do that. You know, but I know somebody who can, or just like, eh, good luck. Sorry, this isn't going to work. Um, like have those clear expectations. It is okay to say no. And you should say no. Should you stretch yourself? Sure. But is that, is it a direction you want to stretch or is it going to be like square peg round hole? So, um, who inspires me? Uh, I, I mentioned up front, like having a list of inspirations. Uh, I mentioned Belinda Coombs uh, a couple of times, uh, you know, from the ring of pain soundtrack, you know, she has a website, Belinda Coombs.com and um, Holschult, uh, who did the Proteus soundtrack, among other things, and Dusk uh, at uh, Holschult.com. Chase Bethia, uh, he did the soundtrack to I Can't Escape Darkness. He streams on a regular basis and is actually fascinating to both listen, uh, you know, to his creative process. And he's very open about his process and is uh, very inclusive. I highly recommend, you know, checking, you know, checking him out. And also his uh, streams on Twitch at uh, ChasePathia.com. Um, some final thoughts. Um, you know, like main takeaways is like, you should be learning by doing Be you know, like the best, the best way to do, you know, to do something is to do it. Like the first step at sucking, or sorry, sucking is the first step. at sort of kind of getting sort of good at something, you know, be patient with yourself and others. Um, you're not going to make the, you know, you will not make the best soundtrack the first time, you know, or the second time or the 10th time, but each time you will get better. And also when you're working with people who may not have the same work style with you or the same communication style, be patient with them and don't, you know, don't give them a hard time just because they are not you know, adhering to like your ideal perfection of what a good workflow is. It's not going to happen overnight. It will take time. Uh, be easy to work with. Again, like being that patient, you know, be patient. You know, if someone asks for something, you know, it's like, that doesn't mean you have to capitulate to every single request, 
But like, you know, if says someone is like, you know, if someone asks you to be flexible to try something different or new or outside of your comfort zone a little bit, it's like, okay, yeah, I can, I, I can work around that. It's like, oh, I need this by Monday. It's like, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, versus like, f you, I, I'm not going to do that. Like, it's good to have boundaries, but it's also like, you know, good to find like ways, you know, compromises that will work for both parties. You know, be flexible, not subservient. You, you know, at the end of the day, your self interest matters more than uh you know making a particular point you know and at the end of the day you are yourself be you um you're not trying to be somebody else you can be inspired by somebody else but you are your own person so that's what i have um you know again my name is john peck thank you so much for watching i you know and listening do you have any questions for me Any advice for non-composer devs uh, regarding uh, best practices with working with a composer one-on-one -on -one for a project, other than being a, de um, a, a decent human? Um, so, yeah, um, having having clear expectations up front, uh, again, like uh, starting the conversation with kind of like, you know, here are some sound alikes, here's like the context, here's like the type of thing that I'm, you know, looking for. You know, if you just say it's like, ah, like any music will do, you know there's music is infinitely variable you know so like have some examples like some you know have some kind of like basis of foundation that you can kind of like start the conversation like you know it can just be one track even like it doesn't have to be something specific or you mean like you know i, I really like the soundtrack to i don't know final fantasy 7 like there you know that's a good place to start you know that that gives a you know a common you know framework also don't limit yourself to game soundtracks like you know it's like i love the tone of i don't you know um you know pick a random work by an artist that you enjoy like you know uh and uh you know it's like use that as the basis or you know other mediums like tv or movie is like here's the soundtrack to witness here's the soundtrack to um you know what what have you um just like there's you know don't limit yourself to a particular genre don't limit yourself to a particular medium when you're trying to communicate a concept just like you know point to something and uh and um uh, you know and then other best practices um yeah okay so ha having the sound alike um having knowing how you're going to put the music in the game is also important like you know what is going to trigger it like have that kind of conversation that's like is this music that's going to start when it's a particular area um is this going to be like a cold start is it going to build up for a couple seconds like you know have you know you know kind of like set that expectation and then also like go through and uh you know practice the mechanics of like actually triggering the music and having control over it um it can be really frustrating if uh you know the music you you have several different tracks playing simultaneously because the you know there is no sense of like what starts and stops them or maybe everything is too loud like you know um actually practice putting music even placeholder music into the game so you can kind of like get a sense of like how that feels ring of pain um yeah my favorite uh song for the classic 80s band the police uh that's uh let's see uh i'm I I'm picturing it and it's from Synchronicity um, by the police. Um, did that help? What is your favorite soundtrack to anything? Uh, movie, game, show, et cetera? Um, there's a lot. Um, I know more recently, uh, I really liked Hans Zimmer's soundtrack to Blade Runner 2049. Um, that was massively inspiring. I mentioned Witness earlier. That's a you know older soundtrack to a Harrison Ford movie from you know the 1980s that was deeply impactful. Uh, the work by Wendy Carlos, uh, electronic musician, um, and Tamita um, also were very instrumental um, in, uh, you know, uh, using synthesizers in unique ways to tell classical uh, experiences and, uh, you know, helped shape my perception of what an instrument was, you know, because I both had a classical introduction to music and um, where it's like, this is a piano, this is a trumpet, you know, this is what an orchestra sounds like. And then to have that inverted and to, you know, take those tropes and be, you know, be presented with a different context. It's like, you know, what is a flute? You know, is it a sine wave? You know, 
what you know what represents a flute to you you know it's like you know and having and, and also like uh you know wendy carlos in particular you know th that approach to um uh, emotion and you know taking an instrument a p you know basically a pile of electronics with knobs and and wires and wiring in such a way that it can produce emotion and you know it you know really makes me really gives you a different framework for um conceptualizing music um let's see um you know what are your three favorite albums of all time um oh geez that depends um uh off the top of my head and this like it, it it massively depends um you know shining black jazz is absolutely fantastic um and impactful um you know for me um i'm trying to think oh man it's like drop the needle um you know it's like i just saw gary newman recently you know it was like that was fantastic nine inch nails um uh, the downward spiral um i've listened to tons of time but also just like listening to nine inch nails uh the quake soundtrack um you know also like has absolutely influenced my approach to industrial ambient um and uh and actually the downward spiral and then the evolution of that further down the spiral the remix all of them and like listening to those different interpretations has absolutely colored my approach towards making remixes of other people's work um and you know the idea of taking something and not just make you know adding a drum beat to it and making you know maybe changing the tempo a little bit but like you know just stripping it down to its barest soul and picking out those individual components and making completely disparate work and remixing the concept of uh you know sampling uh you know from the 70s like cold cuts approach to sampling where you know you take those individual pieces of sound and you make something that is greater than the original works from which it was derived um you know there's no one thing um i offline i can come up with a much more coherent list of things um these are great uh great questions i really appreciate it yes uh nine of sales um cool um uh sam did that answer your question around uh advice for non-composer devs i kind of just crashed on to the next uh question i'm sorry Okay, fantastic. All right. Um, well, if that's it, um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate y'all taking the time. I hope this was useful um, you know, to you. Uh I'm available on Rock Game Dev um, you know, for any additional questions and will continue to participate in this community and others. Um go make music, go make games, go have fun, be beautiful. Thank you. Thanks so much, John.